All right, I am calling us to order with a height quorum at 619 p.m. This is the CV Fiber uh, regular board meeting for July 11th, 2023. Um, I am calling for additions or changes to the agenda. I am making a change to the agenda. I'm moving the action expected items to the top so that we can get them done in case we lose quorum before we complete. And so that's the change I'm making. Do I have any other ch additions or changes to the agenda? Yes, I have one. Okay. I would like to add change in fiber connections to people's homes. And if people don't want to bring that up on discussion, I'm happy to send people a an email about it. Could you type into the chat what that you want that to say, please, as an addition? Because I'm not sure I understood what you said, Alan. <laughs> oh, that's because I have my fan going in the background. Hold on a second. Go ahead, Ray. You, Alan, you, you'd be the first one to say that that wasn't warned. And 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 I'm and I'm shocked, shocked <laughs> that you'd want to have you want to bring this up. And then not that it isn't a good topic. We we were there's an ongoing discussion about that in the background that you're probably not aware of. But in any event, um, it's not been warned in. Well, actually, it's a construction update, and it's I, I think it's very please, much something that please, we can please please. <laughs> Okay. This is really important to talk about, Ray. I think Here, can you so tell me what the item is a... again, please? Yes. Okay, I order, it, order. I put it okay. in chat. Okay, all right, all right. So we will add that discussion as part of the um, construction update and outlook. Any other changes to the agenda? Okay, I'm hearing calling for none. Are there, is there any pub public comment? Chuck, you got something to say? You did, you did move the, the action items to the top of the agenda. Yes, I moved the action Thank items you. to the top of the agenda. Thank you. All right, so the next action item is meeting minutes approval. Jeremy, do you have a motion for us? Yeah, a uh, motion to approve the May 9th 2023 meeting minutes as drafted and the June 13th, 2023 meeting minutes uh, as drafted, but with um, minor corrections by Alan Gilbert. On second. second. I heard RD first, so RD seconded a uh, motion by Jeremy. Do I have any discussion of the minutes approval? Hearing no discussion of the minutes approval. Do I have any objections to approving the minutes? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the minutes have been approved. The motion passes. The next item is communications committee appointments. Chuck? Yeah, um, so the communications committee uh, held our elections in our last meeting uh, and elected myself as chair and Linda Gravel uh, as vice chair. Um, per our procedures, only uh, my ele uh, election needs to be ratified by the board. Uh, but at this point, I will step back and abstain from further conversation and let you all take it from here. Motion to approve Chuck Burt as chair of the communications committee. Second. Second. Motion to approve um, Chuck Burt as chair of the communications committee was made by Jeremy, seconded by David Healy. Um, any discussion? Hearing no discussion, do I hear any objections to approving this motion? And do I have any abstentions? Chuck <laughs> Burt is abstaining from this motion. I'm this motion has been approved. Chuck Burke, congratulations. You're the chair of the communications committee. Yes, Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Chuck, right. and my condolences. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next action item is GIS services contract. Who am I to honor for that? Is that Ray, Janiel? So, so I have a motion drafted, but um, was there somebody else that wanted to speak to that? 
Uh, Linda or, or David, perhaps? Or Janelle. Yeah. I mean, I can yeah. talk. Yeah, I, Janelle. Yeah, yeah, because, um, yeah, so we, we are in need of GIS services. Um, David Healy, who has retired from Stone um, Environmental, as, uh, has been doing a lot of our work uh, for our GIS work. We really need a professional um, paid entity to do our GIS work. It is a lot, it's a heavy lift and it's extremely important. Um, Stone Environmental is also the contractor for the state and has special knowledge for the GIS, specifically for the CUDs and for um, the broadband build out. So it is very important that we, um, that we use uh, this contractor as a single source. Okay, Ray, do you wanna go ahead and make your motion and then we can enter in discussion? Certainly, uh, whereas CB Fiber has a continuing need for GIS services and which are compatible with the VCBB GIS mapping, and whereas Stone Environmental is under contract with the state to provide GIS services to the VCBB, whereas on 6 July, the executive committee vote to recommend that the governing board approve sole source contract with Stone Environmental is moved the governing board approve a sole source contract with Stone Environmental given its synergistic services and the need for CB Fiber to maintain its mapping compatible with the VCB mapping. Second. Motion made by Ray, seconded by Jeremy Matt. And can I have any discussion? Does anybody have any questions, thoughts, observations? Anyone? I just want to thank David for his services with GIS. He's been really, really on top of this. So thank you. Thank you, David. You're welcome. Okay. I'm not. Okay, Alan, go ahead and Go ahead, Alan. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that at the executive committee meeting, we did discuss the possibility of a conflict of interest and determined that there was none. Uh, and just wanted to let people know that we're cognizant of the, of the fact that David was an employee and the way our conflict of interest policy is written, we do have to ask uh, if the person might have a conflict of interest and the person has to give an answer and state why he or she thinks there is no conflict. And David did that, and we accepted his explanation and believe there is no conflict. Okay, thank you, Alan. Anybody else? All right, I'm hearing no further comments. Do I have any objections to this motion? Seeing no objections, do I have any abstentions from this motion? David will abstain. David Healy abstains? Yep. Uh, the motion passes. So the next item is authority to execute agreements. So, uh, so I have a motion on this one. Okay. And basically uh, you should all be aware that um, uh, things are happening fast and furiously and there are all kinds of requirements for uh, authorizations to be given and executions of permits and easements and uh, one thing or another. And um, while the statute says all contracts are signed by the, by the chair, uh, the board can give authority for the executive director to do that. And so the executive committee has, is making a recommendation and I have a motion. And if I can find the beginning of this, <clears throat> okay. Uh, whereas section 3067 of the Vermont statute governing CUD states that the chair of the board shall make and sign all contracts for the district upon approval by the board. And whereas the board under the statute therefore has authority to approve contracts as well as signing authority. And whereas the CV fiber procurement policy defines incidental purchases as acquisitions of supplies or services up to $10,000 under the Federal Acquisition Regula Regulation FAR 2.101. And whereas CV Fiber procurement policy exempts budgeted items from board approval, whereas in the practical day-to-day -day operations of CV Fiber, time is of the essence. It is sometimes necessary to expedite the signing of agreements, including but not limited to utility agreements, agreements with permitting agencies and with entities for whom CV Fiber may need an easement. Whereas on 6 July, the executive committee voted to recommend that the governing board grant authority as described in the motion. It has moved the governing board grant authority to the chair and to the executive director or to either of them to execute agreements where operations ne necessitate the signing of agreements which are necessary, budgeted, and such incidental purchases consistent with CB Fibers procurement policy. 
Second. Right, second. second. <laughs> Moved by Ray, seconded by Jeremy Matt. Woohoo, Jeremy. Do I hear any discussion of this motion? Wow, really quiet out there. No objections, no discussion. Do I have any objections to this motion? Is anybody voting no? Okay, do I have any abstentions? I'm not seeing any abstentions. Motion passes. All right, the Bravo. next thing is the personnel policy. And Yay. that one is Alan, I believe. You are muted, Alan. There we go. I have my fan on, so. <laughs> um, so we are, the executive committee is bringing before the governing board the personnel policy that was first proposed by the policy committee. Most of it was uh, put together by Janiel, and the policy committee reviewed it. If you remember, uh, we brought it to the governing board at the June meeting, and it was asked that it be sent to the executive committee. The executive committee looked at it twice. Um, we gave input, possibility for input to people, to, from people on the executive committee during the time period between the two meetings. There was some um, additional comments that were made. So the policy committee that you should have received uh, from Jerry uh, contains all of those uh, all of those changes that were suggested. There actually weren't very many, and very few of them were in any way, shape, or form substantive. So what you have is a clean executive committee approved proposed policy, except I want to point out. Uh, a total of three sentences that are yellow shaded. They are in pages four and pages six. Uh, I'm sorry, page four and page six. What happened at the meeting was there was conversation about adding uh, a couple of provisions, one of which would allow uh, in reporting harassment that additional people other than the current governing board chair and the, and the current executive director be the people who could receive a complaint of harassment. And there was conversation about, we really ought to uh, appoint other people. Perhaps that could be other board members. Could Perhaps it could be other people connected to us. And we couldn't come up with anything on the moment. Um, but after the meeting was finished, I thought about this myself. And as I was cleaning up the policy, I decided that we could say simply that uh, personnel who wish to report harassment should file a complaint. Again, I'm on page four right now. Uh, to file a complaint with and existing again as the governing board chair, the executive director, we could easily add other CV fiber personnel as appointed by the governing board. So that is one change uh, that I would recommend. And the second uh, important ch change comes uh, <coughs> in the next paragraph down on page four. It's simply a sentence that was added that says procedures will be developed for the investigation process. I think there was some concern uh, in reading this part of the policy about harassment that it was a bit vague um, about how the how an investigation of harassment would take place. And one of the things that we have not done and we're very cognizant must be done is we have to develop procedures for how investigations are being conducted. To do that, we have, uh, I think maybe Siobhan at some point is gonna talk about this. We've been, we've been talking uh, with some legal folks who would be willing to uh, take a look at our policy. It should be reviewed. Uh, and it also is probably going to need some updating anyhow because of some changes the legislature made to harassment policies uh, this past session. Um, but what we're, we plan to do is to work with that person, work with, work with an attorney uh, on developing, developing the procedures for how an investigation would go forward. 
it's not uncommon to have a policy that doesn't have procedures baked into it, but that are developed later. Uh, and they, of course, will come before the board for their approval. Um, but putting language in the policy was something that I thought we could do just so people know that we're not done with making sure this policy gets carried out the way it should be. Uh, it's just the procedures haven't yet been developed, but will be. And then I said there was a third uh, yellow spotted bit of text, and that's on page six. And it simply is the same thing, but to a different part. This is about the, uh, it's a different part of the harassment section. It's the same language other CV fiber personnel is appointed by the governing board. Um, could also be people who could be designated for folks to, to report uh, sexual harassment complaints with. So what I'm gonna suggest is I'd like to move adoption of the personnel policy proposed by the executive committee after its review of the policy is developed by the policy committee. And if once we enter discussion of that motion, I would, uh, I would, I would make a motion to amend uh, the policy so that we can put in those three sentences that I've just described to you. If you think it's improper for me to make a motion to something I've uh, proposed adoption of, I'd be happy for somebody else uh, to make the same motion that I was hoping to make. But I think it's pretty harmless stuff because uh, the ideas came from people who attended the executive committee meetings, and I think we all agree they should be there. Uh, so we would recommend that be done. Okay, so I, I need a motion. So I'm, I'm putting it. I'm putting it into the chat right now. Yeah. Also, Jeremy has his hand up. Right, but Jeremy, can I do, can I, can you talk when I don't have the motion on the table yet? Oh, is it I is it not about the motion? I can talk if you rec if you recognize me. Right, but is it about the motion that we don't have on it's, the table yet? It's a no. It's, it's not a discussion. It's a comment. Um, just okay, saying that we can make the motion to approve it with those things. I don't think we need to make a motion and then amend a motion because we don't have an emotion on the table. I think you can make whatever motion you want, Alan. I actually put in the chat just now adoption of personnel policy proposed by executive committee after its review of the policy is developed by the policy committee. So I I could withdraw that and amend it, uh, Jeremy, to what you suggested. That's fine too. I just wanted to make sure that we're crystal clear that we're moving, we're doing something, we're bringing something out of the executive committee and we're immediately amending it. I didn't want people to think I had snuck something in. So I just want to be crystal clear on this. I'd like to or, second his amendment. We don't have a motion on the <laughs> table because po yet. posting stuff Ray's, into Ray's chat got is a motion. Ray, what's so, so your for, motion? So for, for clarity, Alan, I, I had put together the motion and I think I had assembled the motion and for the executive committee as well. Um, move the governing board approve the personnel policy proposed by the policy committee as amended just now, subject to legal review, which was also um, part of the executive committee um, um, recommendation. Second. Okay, so I have Ray's motion and Jeremy Matt's second. So that is the motion we'll go with. Alan, do you feel a need that, that to amend this motion or does this motion cover what your concerns were? I want to make sure that people know what I have added was not the language, the specific language was not reviewed by the executive committee. What people did was they brought up the idea of okay. the executive committee, and I've tried to put that in after okay. not being able to do that during the meeting. I, I, I understand what you're it. saying. Okay, so Alan, would you make a motion to amend? And RD, I'll get to you in just a second. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't have my uh, people list up to see hands. So, Alan, would you make your motion to amend? Uh, you, you want me to write something in chat? Yeah. I don't think we please. need a motion, just FYI. You don't think so? Can we just, it's a can motion we just to amend the original. 
can we accept as a friendly amendment or do you want a formal motion to amend it alan well it's it's not oh so i I can understand go ahead alan move to amend by adding three sentences that deal with appointment of additional personnel to be people to receive harassment complaints. Yes, that, that I think and that, go ahead. Second. And <laughs> language stating procedures to carry out these policies will be developed. Okay. And David, you second that second portion yep, as well? I did. Okay, yep. so we got seconded, we got seconded. So now we are discussing the motion as amended. You know what we're talking about. We're talking about yeah. this document as a, oh my God. RD, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, I believe the document as presented by the executive committee is the document without the yellow passages. And I think that the, the original motion is to adopt the policy as presented by the executive committee. The amendment should be to add the passages in yellow highlight. Um, once we do that, we will have amended the policy that the executive committee presented to us, and then we, we can then vote. Yeah, we have Chuck? to vote on the amendment, I think is what RD is saying, correct? Exactly. Okay. I no, think there's I, an order I, of I operations here. I, I disagree, okay. and the reason I disagree is Ray's original motion had the language as amended right in the motion. I don't believe we need this secondary, uh, uh, second order uh, motion at all. Uh, I think we could drop it uh, and just <laughs> leverage the original motion um, and and know that the as amended is baked into it. One person's opinion, of course. Um. If I may, um, I, ahead, appreciate this, I appreciate the simplicity, Chuck, but there ha nothing has been amended until we, until this meeting amends it. Yeah, and that's the purpose of the as amended in the motion. That's the thing is it hasn't been though, right? It hasn't been amended. Nobody has right. amended it. So this motion, motion is to it. amend it, <laughs> except, except it, all right, okay, well, so, we, we, so we, I think what we need to do is we need to, Ray and I need to accept a friendly amendment to adopt the motion, then we do the motion to amend, and then we vote on everything. Correct? Alan's Will that make nodding. everyone happy? Alan's nodding. Okay, I'm not convinced it's necessary, but if it makes Alan happy, let's just... It makes me feel better. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. I'm all about <laughs> Alan's feels. Let's make Alan feel better. Do you accept wait. that as a friendly amendment, Ray? I could. I can't wait for Sybil to write this up. Really. Good. Good luck, Sybil. Well, I'm taking notes as well, Sybil. Oh, so yeah. just to. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Right. Put it in the chat room. In the, we'll, in, go ahead, though. Those so, amendments are really important too because if somebody feels they've been harassed, they need to have a safe place to go. They can't just no go to the executive director or the no chair. So it's an extremely important amendment. I just want to no, put it out there. Yeah, no one's arguing about that. Yeah. Do, really. do we need a motion? Do we need a motion to amend? We have that. We have okay. that. And we should That's vote on the motion so to amend. So now we're voting on the motion to amend. Do I have any objections to the motion to amend? Hearing no objections, do I have any abstentions from the motion to amend? I'm seeing no abstentions. The motion to amend passes. We are now voting on the motion to adopt the amended policy as amended that we that we just amended. Do we have any discussion on that? I am hearing no discussion. Do I have any objections to adopting this personnel policy as amended? I am seeing no objections. Do I have any abstentions? I am seeing no abstentions. The motion passes. Woohoo! We have a personnel policy. Go us. All right. That was all of the action items. I'm going to go back to the top of the agenda. Siobhan, thank I just you, want to say thank you to 
Well, I just oh, want to say thank yeah. you to everybody who worked on this. This was a lot yeah, of absolutely. effort. Janelle was incredibly important in helping us to get this together. And it, I, we really should have done this a long time ago, but we've done it now. So thank you very much. RD, your hand is up. Is that a... a oh, no, 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 no. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Okie dokie. All right. All right. So I'm going back to the top of the agenda. Treasurer's report. You've been very patient with us, Lori Beth. Thank you. You are muted. I'm not hearing you. Oh, boy. Okay. I hit the wrong button with my nope, elbow. There we go. There we go. Um, I sent out uh, various financial statements. Um, one is a year to date, one is for the month of June, and what is July up to date. Um, I have not gotten notification from Bonnie that, that they have finished the bank reconciliation, so it is still um, a preliminary yeah. statement. Anybody have anything they want to discuss, add, question about the report? All right, we'll move on to the next item, financial and grant support update. Is that Janelle? Right, Janelle? Yeah, sure. Um, we met with, um, we met with NRTC about helping us with grant readiness for the ReConnect loan that will be coming out in September of this year. It's a loan grant combination, federal. Um, through the USDA, and we're going to be applying to that. We're also looking into VITA, um, that's Vermont Economic Development Authority, financing of up to around $5 million, it looks like, um, and that would be a GAP loan. Um, and we're also working with PFM toward uh, bo bonds going to the bond market. So we have those things going. And then of course there is BEAD and that is a longer term, um, that's longer term funding, but the uh, state of Vermont got $228.9 um, million allocated to it. It's going to be a competitive process, meaning we'll be competing with private sector and we don't know when that money will come or how much will be. Um, there are many requirements to it, such as matching um, and as I said, it was competitive. It is competitive. That is likely not going to um, come until early 2025. So we have 2024 construction season and lights to keep on, um, and that's where we're coming up with Vita, Reconnect, and bonds. Linda, am I muted? Nope. You more. I would just like to say that the more revenues we bring in, the less debt we have to concur. So please, all delegates, when we're coming to your area, to your district, please join into the events that we are currently running so that we can bring in more revenues. We need volunteers for these events. Revenues, revenues, revenues. Thank you. <laughs> Cabot, Cabot, Cabot. Any more observations or comments? All right, the next item is, what was that? That was that one, construction update and outlook, including a discussion of the installation thing or who's he, what's he? Anyway, go ahead, Janelle, that's you, right? Yeah, sure. Um, the, the piece that um, was added as a, as a quote unquote amendment to the um, agenda is that CV fibers dis distributed split design means that we have designed our network to not hang fiber on every single pole. Um, that's because it's a rural area. This is not an atypical way to design the network. And therefore, when drops are calculated from the fiber to your point of connection, that will not necessarily be the closest pole in the road or the right of way to your house. It may be in some cases, depending on where your home is or where your point of connection is, but it may not be. So the distance and the cost of the drop from the nearest fiber hub pole will depend on a site survey. And we realized that looking at our um, website that this was very unclear and wasn't specified. Um, and so I, 
made changes to the website to make it exceedingly clear um, that that this is how it's going to be, um, that costs will be determined based on last hub poll to the point of connection um, due to the fact that this is a distributed split network. There are other construction updates, but I wanted to lead with that because I know that um, it, it's it's something that everyone wants to, or many, many people have brought up recently, so I didn't want to let that go. But I also want to mention from a construction standpoint that we now have 12 crews in the field. Because of the recent rains, they've pulled back some crews where we cannot do work, but we are actively building in Rumney School 01 and 02 and splicing in CL01 and two, CL02 waiting on make ready for CL03. So we are actively constructing in four DAs at this point. Okay. Alan, go ahead. Yeah, I, I can tell you the guys who have been up here in um, the Remney School so-called um, hub, it really is mostly Worcester uh, and the crews that have been working up here these guys were working yesterday until four o'clock in the afternoon. It was unbelievable. And they've been they've been up most weekends. They they work long hours and they have pretty well strung uh, most of what they need uh, to do Hampshire Hill Road, uh, which is a two mile, two and a half mile road that uh, juts off of uh, uh, Minister Brook Road. and eventually connects to West Hill Road, which is what's gonna take the, the cable eventually over to the Rumney School area in Middlesex. But one of the things this has made me cognizant of is I'm getting a lot of questions now, uh, either in person or through email or by telephone about very specific information about what happens next. I first, I first learned about the change in the design of how we'll do connections because of somebody who had found out from somebody stringing fiber near his um, near his house that the line was not going to go as close to his house as he had thought. And when I started digging to try to figure out what the heck was going on, what I found out was that this guy is one of those people who before uh, had fairly close access to a pole, you know, a single pole, and he read on our website that connections will be from a pole. And when he found out that that, that didn't seem to be the case, I started hunting around and realized that there's actually a different kind of, of um, connection system that we'll be using. And that in his case, he actually might be quite a distance from the hub. And you can be up to 2,500 feet from a connection at one of these hubs. And you're gonna be responsible the way that we currently have our, our, our charges set out. You're gonna be responsible for paying a dollar a foot for every foot after 400 feet. So if you are at the furthest point from one of these hubs, as opposed to a pole that might be nearby to you, you're going to be paying a total of uh, $2,199 for a hookup. That really, I, I, I got, a, I got a, a note from somebody that was just lividly angry and very upset that this could possibly be happening. And it's somebody I've talked with before, and he's been very interested in getting connected to CV fiber because he doesn't want to go with other providers because of the way he's been treated. And now he feels he's been treated just like um, the same he's, he's been treated the same way. He's being treated the same way by us as he's been treated by the other providers. So I'm trying to, to work with Janiel uh, and others to try and try and use the ARPA money uh, that Worcester said it wanted to be used to connection of homes in the town to try to figure out a way to smooth this out so that somebody who just by circumstance ends up not being near a hub uh, doesn't really get stuck with a $2,000 bill that he or she wasn't counting on. And I think that's especially true if it's a low-income person. 
I mean, that's that's just we, I, I I just can't we just can't let that happen. That's we have to have greater equity uh, if we say we believe in some degree of equity on something like this. So I, I'll stop. Um, if if anybody's interested, I I've actually come up with a, a more uh, with a written explanation about all this because I think it's somewhat complex, but it's actually pretty straightforward once you realize how the new distribution system works. Okay, RD, you're next. Are there maps of the hubs? Do we know where the hubs are? Yeah, we do. It's part or of the system. Yeah, it's part of our design. Okay, I, I, <clears throat> I'm not sure I can extract that datum from all of the maps and data that have been presented to us over the last couple of years. Is there some way to produce a, um, a chart, a map of the hubs? So we know where they are and how far our underserved and unserved uh, potential uh, clients are located uh, far, far from those hubs. Yep. So we have requested that information from NRTC, who is our design engineer who did the design. Um, we can do it ourselves looking at each individual map, but we can extract more general numbers like um, like estimates for how many towns and or how many houses in a particular town what the cost is going to be um, so that's from our perspective so that we have predict predictability of that and NRTC is getting us that information but then there's another question and that is how the consumer knows and I, I think that's actually a more important well that's that, that is an important yeah. question right so yeah. uh, so how the consumer knows is when Waitsfield goes out and does the site survey, they do the estimate for where um, that hub pole is based on um, based on the design. Uh, but that's that there that's how the consumer or the customer would know what the drop cost would be. Site yeah, survey. we can always we can always put those charts and maps on our website, and uh, and potential consumers can determine for themselves how much it's likely to cost them to run a drop to their home or business premise. That would be a GIS um, question. I, I, you, you very well may be right, RD, uh, as far as whether that's feasible to do. I know we just put mapping up on our website for construction passings. So I, I, I'm not 100% sure if that is feasible or what the lift would be to do that, but that's something that uh, you, we can question, especially now that we're going to be retaining stone environmental for GIS work to see if it would be a feasibility so that the consumer can see where their where the hub site is based on our design and therefore what the potential cost might be. Okay, RD, I'm going to move to John Morris. Okay. Go ahead, John. Uh, I just like a whole lot better explanation of what we're talking about. <laughs> I, I want to take a stab at this one. The fiber is going along specific routes that has been designed by our designer. There's little it's magic not going boxes. Along every road? No, it is not. It, there are little magic That's what boxes. I was told in the past. There are little magic boxes called MSTs that are on the fiber. How far you are from an MST is what determines how much your cost is going to be for the drop, not how close you are to a pole, it's how close you are to the MST that is on the fiber that is being strung, not necessarily on a road that you're on, but maybe the next road over. Does that MST make sense? is like but, a splitter. The, 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 the thing that you're missing, I, I think that explanation, Siobhan, is that, the, um, is that, that we're not running the MSTs necessarily all the way out to the end of a particular road right now the way our design goes there are some places particularly in dead ends where we go up to a certain point and then we stop even if there's a house and or some poles beyond that point so am i to understand that this is only about dead end roads no no, but that's so that's, I, that's a useful case to think about. Well, it's not the only useful case, apparently, and I Fair. need to know all of the possibilities because I need to be able to talk to my constituents right. in a way that makes it clear to them before they get some kind of wrong impression because 
I feel right now that I've already gotten the wrong impression and now I'm feeling like I was told the wrong information before. So, so the, I want to ask a different question and see if you guys can answer that in a way that makes sense to me and is truly accurate. Uh, so if my constituent sees the crews running fiber on the telephone pole that's at the end of their driveway, is that the telephone pole that they have to measure to to get the 400 feet? Or is there another telephone pole where the hub is actually located? If, if they're running it to the pole in that person's yard, they're all set. It's the person who is three poles away, or pers houses, uh, th multiple houses that are three poles away, that is the different story where you can end up with multiple feet going there. Um, so it's what these splitters are, and this, this is complicated because a splitter can serve four houses, eight houses, 12 houses, and 32 houses. And so depending on what the network looked like in your neighborhood, I mean, for example, in my neighborhood, there are three, there's a four-way splitter, two pole, three poles away from my house. So to get from that splitter to my house, it's going to have to connect to two more poles and then go my, get my underground to my house. So, you know, what I'm aiming to do, and this may not be the solution for anybody else, I'm having all three of us sign up at the same time so that we can split the cost of the uh, the distance. Um, but it's, it's, I can tell you the average distance, the numbers we got earlier, preliminary numbers, the average distance from a splitter to a house is 600 feet. So on average, we're exceeding it by 200 feet than our, what our policy is. But there are there are cases where, I forget, I did a table on the percentage by distance. The bulk, you know, the majority of people are under 400, 50% is under 400, but the next 50% ranges all over the ballpark. And so if if my neighbor who is further along the road chooses to get CV fiber before I do, then I'm going to be able to take advantage of their expense. <laughs> Is that correct? We're working on that one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Daniel, how do you feel about that? Yeah. So we're talking to Waitsfield now about doing a cluster that would be considered a cluster drop where they could do a drop um, along the road to multiple neighbors and, and then the neighbors would split the cost of that. Oh, what John is suggesting is he's going to wait till his neighbor. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. The, okay, so I want to, so, I want to, yeah, I, I have a couple of things to say here, and I'm going to take over for a second. <laughs> this is a real problem that we have got to address. This is not just like I can, I can manage to swing a couple thousand if I have to by shifting some money around in my budget, my neighbors are never gonna be able to do that. And there are tons and tons of people in our district who are never gonna be able to get that. And we cannot possibly dangle this carrot in front of them and not and, and just make it impossible for them to get connection. We just can't. And right now, even if we put a map on the website so people can look at it, a lot of people aren't gonna have time to look at it. That that's and they're, they're or they're not going to calculate it out properly, or something like that. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying that is not a complete answer to the issue. Um, a lot of people don't even understand how maps work anymore, um, and and it's just I I am really concerned about this. Not personally because I talked to Lucas and found out I really don't have anything to worry about, but. My neighbors are all going to have stuff to worry about. And and Alan's example, that's going to make people feel baited and switched. There's no there's no two ways about it. In the long run, these drops, it's like when the electricity came out. When there were some properties I was looking at when I was building a house, I was going to have to pay several thousand dollars to get electricity to. And I was considering that part of the expense. But these, but for the most part, this people already have the power lines to their house. And so they're expecting to not have to do big, long installs to their houses. And this is how we've been billing it. We haven't been telling people this. And so I think that may be part of what Alan's big concern is, is, and what do we do to fix it? 
how do we offset that? RD, is your hand I, still I up? He, I, I thought I'm, he had a suggestion. I thought I heard a suggestion for this, and that was uh, town ARPA funds. Is that not what Alan was suggesting? It's not going to be sufficient to cover no, the No, the it extent. is not. And Jeremy, no, Matt, not. you've been and waiting we, patiently. And, well, but just excuse me. I think you called on me. Our, our, our I, I was, go ahead. Sorry, our, we are we allocated our ARPA funds last year, and this was not part of the information that uh, that my select board was uh, in possession of when it voted fifty thousand dollars of ARPA funds to CB Fiber, and at my insistence, wrote the check at once. So this is new information, and it is so not information. Obviously, it is not information that governing board members have had, and it's certainly not information that our um, that our potential customer base has had. Those who are unserved see, and you, underserved. If you don't know exactly how many people have the long runs, how do you know that opera funds from your town won't cover it? I. I can tell you that $50,000 of ARPA funds is not going to cover all those drops. And furthermore, that is not what we were anticipating when we made the appropriation. We, and we certainly anticipated perhaps subsidizing some uh, potential subscribers or directing uh, that service be provided initially to certain locations in Cabot. But this exceeds the information that we had at the time we made the appropriation. It certainly exceeds the information that I have had to this point. Okay, RD, I'm going to... I'm going to ask I'm you to done. stop there. Jeremy's, yep. Jeremy's been waiting patiently. Go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really tough thing because you're right. I, I felt the same way that you do, RD and John, that this kind of came out of the blue, that I was not, ex that I was not aware of this when we were talking about what we were going to do for a design. And then the design had been made, and this had been a decision that was made. Um, at some point, I think we are going to need to do a cut saying we're not going to cover, you know, something that is over X distance from the from the pole just because I don't know that we can afford it. I mean, that's that's the other piece is we're trying to make this affordable and I don't know. I don't know where that cutoff is, um, but. I do think that we should cover some of it more than we have. I don't think that we should have an average install being 200 feet longer than, um, I think, uh, based on David's preliminary thing. I don't think we should have a, a you know, um, an average install that is 200 feet longer than the maximum that we will pay for. I Jeremy, don't know what done? the solution is. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. I'm kind of wondering. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, David, go ahead. Yeah, just just I have to tell you that somebody who's been involved with the design for, I guess, almost two years, so a year and a half, until I looked at some of the make-ready work and design and detail in the last three months, I was not aware of this particular problem. But at the same time, when they told us they're going to do a you know MST multiple split design, I didn't know what that meant, and we just didn't ask the right question at that time um, to really understand what it meant. And so um, it's not like I, f I feel a little blindsided or stupid for not fully understanding what how they were designing the network, so we could have explained this earlier and then better understood. What was this going to mean financially to the district and, and to individuals? Um, it, it, this doesn't get the person who does have a splitter at their pole and their house is 3,000 feet away. We're not going to pay for that. But for the person who's, you know, 
a thousand feet or fifteen hundred feet away from a splitter when there are two more poles between his house and the uh, and the MST. That that hurts. So we got to figure this out. Okay, um, uh, John, I'm going to let Linda go ahead of you because she hasn't had a chance to address this yet. Go ahead, Linda. Thank you. I think we need more data. Is We can't really make a decision upon how to fix this without more data of knowing exactly how many people would be affected who really want service, in other words, because there may be people who are uh, far away, but they're not interested in service because they've already got some service they're very happy with. We need to know more data exactly about how many people would be affected by this who are really interested in service. Okay, uh, John and RD, I'm going to let Chuck go ahead because Chuck has not spoken to this yet. Thank you, Sean. Um, I, I actually was going to make a similar point to what Linda was saying. We just we just don't have enough information to even begin to take action on this yet. Um, we need to know things like, you know, if we were to cover that gap between the MST and the closest poll when somebody subscribed, what would be the financial impact on us? What would that do to the rates we have already determined and set and advertised? Um, how you know, how would we cover that? How would that change our construction plans over time? Because it means we potentially run out of money a little bit sooner than we are currently anticipating. We will run out of money. Um, we we like I, I I would propose that we probably need some sort of task force to go off and try to accumulate some of answers to some of these questions uh, to bring back to the board before we take any action on this, uh, other than acknowledge that, hey, we certainly have a problem on our hands of our, of our you know, uh, uh, to contend with. Second. <laughs> okay. Um, and now John Morris. Uh, I, I have two, two points that I'd like to make. Uh, the first is I've heard several people say that we simply can't afford to do this to to cover this distance, this additional distance that is beyond what it sounds like most people thought it was going to be at, at one point. Um, I'd like to suggest that maybe we can't afford not to cover that because if if we give the reputation, get the reputation of being the same as all of the other Internet providers, then we're going to lose subscribers. And if we lose subscribers, we're losing a lot more than just a little installation fee of a few hundred dollars or whatever it is. Uh, and and also, if we simply if we ha simply have the the case that half of our subscribers uh, who might subscribe are going to be above the limit, and they end up having to pay, and they don't do it, then that's we're we're limiting ourselves to only half of the people out there as being possible subscribers. Um, and now I've forgotten what the other point was, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, hey, RD, go ahead. I just want to point out that we have known what the grid looks like from the get-go. We just didn't, uh, nobody told us that we weren't going to cover the grid. It was an assumption that we all made that we were going to cover the grid. We were going to lay fiber wherever we needed to in order to reach people who were on the grid and wanted service. We never proposed to serve people who were off the grid and didn't want service from, uh, from uh, telephone companies or uh, power companies. I've told people in Cabot who were off the grid, if you're off the grid, you're off fiber. We have no responsibility to serve you. But we do have a responsibility, and we've stated a responsibility to serve all of the people who are on the grid, who are unserved or underserved, according to our standard. This changes. This is a change in our um, in our um, presentation. This is a change in our mission. And uh, I think it's a disastrous one. We're already being poached in some on some of our backwoods by other providers. And I, I, I it, it's kind of shocking to me that um, that that this essential apparently 
essential component of our design has never been made explicit and that so many governing board members are unaware of it. If we're unaware of it, where has it been? How are we going to explain this to our constituencies? Okay, I've said enough. All right, Jeremy, Matt? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely hear you, RD, and agree with everything that you said. Um, I also would note that we're substantially more expensive than what Fidium is offering already without adding another, you know, however many million dollars in install fees. And are we going to lose customers because we have to up our rates, you know, another five bucks a person? To cover this I, I don't i really i don't know what the answer is which is why i agree with chuck that we need to get to the bottom of what the numbers are what the costs are and then make a decision that's informed based on actual numbers like what is this going to do to our arpu rate if we cover this that's my two cents sounds like finance committee to me Okay, so I don't have any more people with their hands up. I want to wrap up this discussion. We do have an issue. We have a messaging problem. We have a money problem, and we have to work on getting data to figure out how we can best address this. Um, Alan has his hand up. Go ahead, Alan. You're, You're muted. muted. Yeah, there you go. Come on, I, I just wanted to say thank you for, for uh, allowing this to be discussed. One of the things that's going to get very make this very complicated is that when when towns gave money, ARP money to CD fiber, they had the opportunity to designate how they would like that money to be spent. And one of the options was specifically for making connections in your town. So if you if you remember, these were MOUs uh, that, that were developed and signed by by both the town select board and by the CV fiber board. So we have an obligation now for that ARPA money that it was designated by some towns for connections to use it for that if we think there's a problem. The problem is not all towns gave ARPA money to CV fiber, so that pool is not going to be available. And second of all, even if you did give ARPA money, but you didn't designate it that you wanted it used for connections, I think it can be argued we don't have an obligation for, for, for us to use the ARPA money that way in that particular town. So I really am worried that towns are going to all of a sudden be in very different situations and untangling the inequity of this is going to be very, very difficult. Um, okay, RD, go ahead. Uh, um, Alan, I... Uh, with respect to your point, my select board has never been offered an opportunity to designate uh, a, a targeted uh, expense of the ARPA funds that we donated. That has not been part of the dialogue. And um, my... RD, I'm, RD, I'm going to stop you there because that's part of the okay. standard language of the MOUs. That was well, part of the... the Yes, I know we were we we would have the opportunity to make some kind of designation, some kind of appropriation of our ARPA funds, and they would have to be expended in town. But so far, there has been no process, at least none that's been presented to my select board on which I sit, <laughs> by which we ha we have an opportunity to assess the needs in our community and designate where those ARPA funds are going to be expended in Cabot. Okay, RD, at this point, I'm, I'm going to stop the, okay. this dialogue and suggest that you look at the MOU that your town signed and read it again. Because there, I looked at ours and ours was specific and we had the option to opt, in, opt into a number of different things. And drops was one of them. And but yeah, so there's there's issues. Agreed, there's issues. There's problems. We're not sure how we're going to handle it. There is a great inequity here, and we have to we have to address it. And I think we can move on now. 
because we're not going to solve it tonight. And I think that we're all a little surprised and upset. And we need more information. We need more data. We've got a request into uh, NRTC, those yep. dubers. Is that who they are? Okay. Uh, for more for more data so we can s determine the extent of this problem and uh, and figure out a course of action. We'll fix it. We'll figure it out. I believe in us. Um, okay. Ah, so is there more to the construction update and outlook that you wanted to say, Janiel? Oh, Chuck, Chuck's got his hand up. Chuck, it better be good. Yeah. Just before we close that last issue, I would like to suggest we we have a clear path of who is going to be accountable for running with getting some of that information and answers. Is that Janiel? Is that David? Uh, who who should that be? Who is going to own making sure that you know we get somewhere on the issue? Okay, and Alan, do you, were you going to address that point? You're muted. Yeah, I really think it's got to be Janiel. I mean, it, this is something that uh, she's well versed in doing because of her background and because of her basic intelligence. And <laughs> I think we need somebody who's not directly involved in this, in the sense of being a town delegate. I mean, I, I'm 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 really worried how I'm going to explain this to my town and to some of my friends. And I would like to have somebody like Janiel be in charge of looking at this with um, lenses that are, that, that, that are clear and, and don't have a lot of fingerprints on at this point. Okay. All right, Second. so how about this? <laughs> Janiel is gonna report back to the board at the next board meeting on the status yeah. of getting information data for us to, you know, the scope of the problem cost blah 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 does that make sense yeah. i'll get i'll get numbers from nrtc so that we understand the scope of the financial impact um okay what 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 this is going to cost for each town and also um the, the first step with the the mous is to hone in on the specific intent because everybody had a general intent but the specific intent about x dollars and how it's going to be allocated is a conversation that needs to happen at least with the first five towns where we're going to go live soon um, so I'd like to start with those conversations with um, using okay. the select board and or the delegates for those those first five towns to um, to talk about allocation of um, ARPA funds. Okay, and Janiel, can we rely on you to do that as well? Yeah, th those two okay. scopes are, go hand okay. in hand because okay. the That's ARPA allocations yep. will will impact the total cost. Okay, Chuck and Jeremy, you're, you're Chuck. Your hands are up, and I don't want to extend this conversation further. We have more agenda items. I know. Uh, just a quick suggestion for Janiel uh, is to differentiate between private roads and poles that are along public roads, because I think that that might be a differentiator in people's minds. Um, so if we get numbers that could be split by that, I think that might be useful for the discussion. Possibly. Yeah, I don't, I, don't I, I don't know. We said grid. We said people on the grid. We didn't differentiate private road and town road when we said people on the grid. So I'm with RD on that oh. one. We said okay, people well, on the grid. Well, poll, po yeah. Or polls owned by consumers versus polls oh, owned yeah. by... Yeah. All right, fair enough. All right, that's fair enough. Yeah, we'll okay. see how we how NRTC can break it down for us in, a, mm -hmm. in the most predictable manner. Thanks, Okay, Tim. cool, cool, cool. All right, I'm closing discussion on this. Where'd my agenda go? Who stole my agenda? <laughs> Construction well, update waiting. and outlook. No, you shut up, Jeremy. You shut up. You're going to let you talk the rest of the meeting. No. No, I'm just teasing you. All right, so the next thing is, Janiel, did you have more construction update and outlook that you wanted to discuss since we don't have Lucas here? Well, uh, or we should I just have... move on? Well, we do have a map up. It's been a month since we've met um, with the governing board. So if anybody doesn't know, we have a map up on our website now that shows all of the passings on a weekly basis where we've already placed uh, fiber. So if, you're, if your address has been passed, you can go onto our homepage and see where the uh, passings have been made. And that is where fiber has been dropped. And soon... <laughs> 
when we go live that will be green dots. Those red dots will turn green. John? Where on the website can we find that? Yeah, you can find that right on the first page. If you go to the home page, it's front and center right to the right in the, on the, on stevefiber.net on our home page. Okay. Thank you. The map is a little messed up at the moment. Okay. All right. Chuck, I'll talk uh, to you about it later. John, your hand is up. Yes, I just wanted to know, uh, do these addresses, getting back to that previous issue, do these addresses, does this mean that these addresses are, uh, <laughs> the fiber has passed by the closest pole, passed on that closest pole, but they're still going to have the potential to have another 2,500 feet beyond getting to the pole. Okay, yes, that means that we have built out the fiber uh, to Just pass sort of, that address, yeah. but yeah. that doesn't mean that they won't have a very long split or there aren't other poles closer to them. Thank you. Any more construction or outlook? That's yeah. We're just hoping, so, we're like, hoping that the cabinet gets lit <laughs> next week. We are, yeah. So we're working Ooh. with our friendlies. We're working with our friendly landlords um, on three different aspects of testing the network. They're testing the billing system. They're testing the network itself, and they're testing the um, subscription of the services. So those three things are all happening right now. We're running into. Um, you know issues that we're we're working through, and that's the, that's the point of testing the network. So we have eight friendlies that we're working with in Calus um, to start, or in the the first distribution area. Calus and Worcester. Oh yeah, no, you're right. yeah, yeah, right, right. Just yeah, exactly, David. Yep. Did you contact Chuck about that issue, Janelle? <sighs> David Lawrence. Um, I'm recognizing David Lawrence. Yeah, I just again, you know, so I guess I didn't understand the passing either, and I just want to make un see if this is an accurate also phrasing. It just means that those addresses are ones that um, the, the 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 access goes within 2,500 feet of that address. No. Well, it's actually that that we're done building fiber as close to that house as we're going to build fiber to that house on our network design. So that means that you can sign up for a site survey so that you can get service. Right. The, okay. So that tends to imply though that it is within the 2500 limit. No. It does it does it does tend to imply that the MST is there, so that means that um yeah, the the longest MST is 2500, but there, you could still have longer distances. David Healy, you 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 you've wanted to jump in and make my message clearer so well right. the, the the network has an mst connection to your house and how many poles it goes through is undetermined there's no magic number of 2500 feet from the mst or is it 40 feet from the mst so it's a pretty much it's a pretty random number of feet from the mst to these locations so the passings they mean there's there's an MST that serves every house that's being passed. That's all it means. It doesn't tell you how far it is or. or on right. That. I'm not asking for it, but it, it I, that I think makes my original statement accurate. Then that that does imply that there is an MST within 2,500 feet. I ha I couldn't tell you. Uh, I okay. I can tell you what the longest M the, the longest distance is, but I don't have it in the spreadsheet in front of me right now. 2,500 is pretty close to it. That's the longest, as I recall, the longest distance between an MST and a house. Right. Okay. Okay. All right, Tom Fisher. Um, I know it's still quite early, but do we have any sense yet of uh, how or if this weather event that we've been experiencing is going to impact our construction? Good yes, question. it already has. Um, and unfortunately, we got a call from Eustis this afternoon that said that they had to pull some of our crews and put them in NEK because they couldn't work on the roads where they were going to be working. So, yes, it has already impacted us. The good news is that we were concerned a couple months ago that we might, during this summer season, lose crews to the hurricane seasons down south, and then we'd really lose them. We'd lose them to the out-of-the-state 
And right now they've been um, repurposed to the NEK um, so, so they can turn around and come back when it's safe to do so. Uh, that means that, yes, it has been impacted and the, tr the crews have not gone as far as we were concerned they might go if they had to be put to some other emergency in the South or something like that. Okay, is there any more construction update or can we move on to marketing services and community relations? Okay, moving on to community relations and marketing services. Janiel? So we are hiring a community relations manager. We have four interviews scheduled this week. We decided to go local. Uh, we, we wanted to hire somebody who is local to the area, Vermont at least, and with marketing experience. So we are going to be interviewing for folks and hopefully by next month, we'll be able to make a vote on a recommendation for our marketing professional. Linda. Um, we have sent out postcards. I think we sent out so far four different sets of postcards. Um, we are setting up an event for the Berry Heritage Festival coming up on, I think it's the 28th and the 29th of the month. And we are looking for volunteers to help with that event. Uh, all these are trying to get people subscribed to our service. Uh, so we really can get more revenues out of this. David Healy is having uh, two workshops coming up on the 18th and the 27th. Is that right, David? Yep, yep. 18th and 27th. Yep. Okay, for the town where we are currently building in. So uh, you should invite people to these workshops. Uh, postcards, I think about 1,500 postcards went out about David's workshop. Two workshops coming up. So marketing has started. Uh, we are um, doing events and postcards on a rotating yeah. basis based yeah. upon oh Lucas's telling us when the trucks are arriving into that district. That's the first set of postcards that are going out. Anybody have questions about the marketing that we're working on? I wanted to say, I'm trying to be fast. Y'all are ruining my record here. Um, that uh, <laughs> I'm a little concerned about going to Barry Heritage Days when we're not gonna be in Barry anytime soon. And and Barry uh, Heritage Festival covers all of Washington County. I have been doing the Berry Heritage Festival for the last five years with the Democratic Party, and I can tell you, it's a lot more than just Berry people. Oh, yeah, because I just always stayed away from there. Okay. It was just too many people. All right. All right. All right. All right. That's what we want. Lots of people. Come Marketing on. services and community relations. Are we done with that one? Did we? That, that was what we were, we were just going over that. Is there any more on that? Well, um, there's a, uh, there's, I need to work with, we need to work with the delegates from the first five towns uh, where we're lighting. So I've actually invited the delegates to those first five towns to our uh, community outreach meeting tomorrow morning. It is a, it's an optional meeting, um, but I, I did send the invite out to those um, top five uh, first five town delegates. We also um, offered a uh, what you need to know training to those uh, those delegates um, last Friday, and we'll continue. And that was a recorded too. Uh, if it, it, we, we continue to um, provide training, and part of it is this this drops connection and how you communicate with your town. And then when we move into the MOU and ARPA allocation discussion. Um, then I'll want to have close communication with the towns, the select boards, and or the, the delegates. Um, and, and we would like to have the delegates um, involved in the community outreach events, uh, like what David is doing in Calais is great. We also had postcards, going, as Linda said, going out for that event. So a, a big part of the community outreach is working with especially the delegates where service will be offered first so that we can get our messaging straight and get delegates and the towns involved. And there's a message uh, task force that works on that, just getting out the messaging. And so if you want messaging, we would prefer that you use the messaging that is being put together by this task force. 
Tom? Um, having attended the uh, Adamant uh, cookout last Friday, some early feedback is that I got repeated statements of, well, I've already signed up for notification. Um, so that I don't need to find out more about drops or attend this webinar. <laughs> um, I'm all set. I've got the card. I, on the other side of that is I've already signed up and the information I got was not very useful. So I guess I'm not going to get it. I just, no, no, attend the workshop. That's how you will find out. Um, but I had to repeat that several times. I had sorry. a really hard time hearing you. I'm no, sorry. No, no. So the, the main point was that um, folks who have signed up for notifications may be a bit confused about needing to sign up again to get service. Oh, you know what? And exactly, that so isn't. Yes, Tom, that is exactly the issue I'm running into with the friendlies right now. And um, and Linda said, hey, did you bring that to Chuck's attention? No, Chuck is on vacation. I didn't yet, but I will. Um, yes, we we have that glitch. And that's something we talked about with Waitsfield today. Um, it is actually a crowd fiber bug. It is a problem with their system because they want to prevent duplicative entries. So they've made it so that if you've already signed up, it basically puts you in this um, corner and, and and it's becoming problematic because that's how we're testing our system is in phases. Um, so it, it it's a problem that crowd fiber intends to fix is working on, but the, the, the time frame has been kind of loose. Like um, I guess on Friday it was being done right now, um, but we don't have a date certain. So, Janelle, if I understand this right, if I yeah. signed up as a pre-registrant, not a friendly, yeah. yeah, and now I can sign up, I you go still... into, I can go into Forgot Fiber, and I end up in this loop. Um, right now there is a glitch. Yes, and Tom is mentioning it, and I've heard it from the friendlies as well. So it's a problem that is can a problem that Crowd Fiber. It's a bug in Crowd Fiber. Yes. So could we could do we delete all the pre-registrants? Start all over again? I don't think that's the case, Janiel. I think it's just the way that the friendlies got signed up through Waitsfield. That's yeah, what but I think. Tom is saying he's heard it from other people as well, and we weren't sure if we were going to see it with other people, but we know that it's a problem with other um, with other CUDs because it's something that Kurt is working on with Ellie right now at Maple. So we do know it's a problem beyond just our friendlies. Chuck, it's unaf. It's unfair to Crowd Fiber to call this a bug. Um, this it's designed and working as they originally intended it to. The problem is it's just a really confusing user experience, and our users are getting confused because of that. Um, and so the work that Crowd Fiber is doing is to streamline that. Uh, I wouldn't hold our breath on any sort of you know immediate uh, immediacy in terms of getting a resolution to it, um, but uh, you know I will say that it is working exactly as was intended and as we knew it would work, um, and it's just really confusing to them. There is there is one quick change that I think we can make that will make it a little that we can make on our side that I think will make it a little bit. Uh, clearer and, and easier. Um, and so when I'm back in the state later this week, I will start to, to drill into that to see if we can we can make that change. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, the, the point being that uh, we do kind of have to live with this for, for the time being. Um, and the best thing to do is uh, to explain to those, those folks that um, in order to register again, which we do need them to do, they need to be prepared that it's going to send an email to them and that they need to yeah. click a link in that email in order to continue with that registration, which is a little bit wonky, but that that is the way it works. And we went through this in testing, by the way. So yeah. I, si I signed up as a pre-registration for CLO1. I have not gotten an email. Bob Ditto. Fisher, go ahead. Ditto in CLO2. Um, can we oh, right. take CO2. that Sorry. list of um, right. of, of pre-registrants and send them a special email that says, "Okay, you are now open for a regular sign-up, and here's a link to click." And yeah, yes, that, that's what. Well, yes, and and Tom, that's what we did with our friendlies, and they weren't getting the email, and that's where it got confusing. Um, 
And that's what I've been working on. And that's what I brought to Waitsfield today. And that's where they said Crowdfiber had to fix it. And I know it's not a bug, but it is very confusing. If they're not getting their email and, you know, our, our friendly checked spam and it wasn't there and she checked to see who that it came from somebody else and couldn't find it. So it is extremely confusing. This is why we need friendlies. Is so far, only, only one friendly has tried this, as far as I know, right, Janelle? I think only one friendly was successful, which is not a good rate. We have that's 28 because I helped her. We have no, that's because people. I helped her. We have 28 okay, people. Okay, 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 okay. I'm sorry, but we're running late. Oh. And we've got one more item on the agenda. Is there more to do with the website and marketing update that the board needs to know? Okay, no. Management consultant and legal counsel engagement is the last item on the agenda. This should be short. This is going to be short, right, Janelle? <laughs> is this Janelle? Um, Just to make it clear, Janelle is not responsible for us being over. It's us, us mouthy board members. I'm looking at you, Jeremy. You can't see me looking at you, but I'm looking at you. <laughs> I'm well, sorry, Gina. To be fair, we did start 20 minutes late, so. Oh, that's you know, right. I, I blame Tom Fisher for that. It's Tom <laughs> Fisher's fault. Yeah. Okay, cool. It's my fault that there's 46 feet of water where there shouldn't be. Right. <laughs> right. I'm sorry, Janelle. I'm sorry. Go. Ahead. You were you gonna do the legal engagement? Um, Since I so don't have Jerry here. Sure. So so uh, we are we are um, yes. We are retaining um, legal counsel for HR, um, and that is no action expected. So we just oh, wanted to give not. a notice. Yeah, no, it's it's yeah, it's just, it, it's just an update. It was approved by executive committee, but yeah, this is, um, yeah. Yeah, and the purpose of this legal counsel is to help guide us as we implement our personnel policy and help us do procedures and make sure that we're reviewing the new law that has come down to make sure we're doing it right because we didn't do this before and we need to do this because we have employees now. Does anybody want to have any discussion about that? <laughs> That's okay. something that is going to be applied to the governing board. Yes. Not just Absolutely. employees, right? To the governing board. The governing board is explicitly called out in the policy. Just want to make sure. Yes, absolutely. And um, okay, does anybody have anything else that they want to say? Because I don't want I, I did have been rubbing rush rough shot over you for the last you know twenty minutes or so. I'm not seeing anybody having anything. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and adjourn this meeting. This meeting is adjourned at 7:41 p.m. Thank you all very much. You've been very kind. Mm -hmm.